Uh, buenos dias. Uh, gracias por invitarme a hablar en esta conferencia. As you've guessed, yo no hablo español. <laughs> but it's a great pleasure to be here, and I do thank the organizers for the invitation today. It's a great honor, um, and I'm delighted um, to be here. As some of you will have heard me say, um, I have just recently come from Mexico, so I'm quite jet-lagged. Um, so if I stop making <laughs> sense or anything, just throw something at me, and <laughs> I'll, I'll start working again, um, I think, or I hope. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, a large project um, that I've been involved with, which is being um, led by University College London, which is about what works to reduce crime. Um, what do we know from systematic reviews of the available evidence base, and what else um, do we think that we need to know? So I'm going to talk you through that project and the larger research agenda associated with it over the next um, 40 minutes or, or an hour. Okay, so I'll talk, first of all, about the background to the What Work Center for Crime Reduction Consortia. I'll explain what that is um, in a moment. I'll talk about systematic reviews um, and the methodological approaches which are used to produce them. So the focus of this talk really is about systematic reviews of the evaluation evidence base and what that tells us about what reduces crime. I'll then talk to you about a framework that we've developed, uh, which is called EMI. Um, a lot of the work that we've done um, involved coming up with this acronym, EMI, because um, you have to remember something in order for it to be useful, so I'll talk you through that. I'll talk about the um, What Works um, Crime Reduction um, Toolkit, which is an online resource for practitioners and academics alike to give an idea of what the evidence base tells us about what works to reduce crimes. I'm then going to talk about a large exercise we've conducted which informs the toolkit, which is a review of systematic reviews. So we've looked at published systematic reviews to see how good they are and what they tell us about what works to reduce crime. So, as you'll know, there have been worldwide efforts to capture evidence on what works to reduce crime. Um, the Campbell collaboration in particular um, support and commission systematic reviews of the research evidence base. And I'll talk in more detail in a moment what a systematic review is exactly. Um, but they promote um, and publish systematic reviews. The Crime Solutions website, or um, Clearinghouse in the United States, does two things. They take primary evaluations of interventions and they translate them into a more accessible language for practitioners. <coughs> and they assess the methodological adequacy of those primary evaluations as well as translating them into more easy to understand language. And more recently, uh, Crime Solutions have additionally been putting um, information about systematic reviews on their website. But they haven't yet done this in a, in a systematic way. And the way they've done it is a little different to the approach I'm going to talk about. Um, this morning. There's also the Crime um, and Policing Matrix, which is produced by uh, Cynthia Lum and her team at George Mason uh, University. As the name suggests, this focuses very much on policing initiatives, and the idea is to collate information on which policing initiatives reduce crime and how effective they are um, at doing so. In the United Kingdom, uh, the UK government has funded seven What Work Centres. And these focus on topics such as crime, which is what I'll talk about this morning, health, early intervention, and local um, economic growth. And they've provided substantial funding in some cases to set up um, and to ensure the continued work of these What Works centres. The centre that I'll talk about this morning, the What Works Centre for Crime Reduction, is hosted by uh, the UK um, College of Policing. But funding was provided by the Economic and Social Research Council for a university consortia to help set up um, that What Works Centre and to develop the evidence base um, that it would draw upon. And it's that work I'll talk about this morning. So we have a number of different um, work packages, which I'll talk you through very briefly. And ultimately, we've produced um, the online toolkit that I mentioned previously. And the idea is that that online toolkit will provide information to practitioners uh, which is in a digestible format and that's easily accessible. Um, 
if you've ever tried to find information on what works to reduce crime, you'll know that it can be an enormous task just finding that evidence, let alone um, understanding it. So the idea was to produce a toolkit that was a kind of one-stop shop for practitioners, which would take all the effort out of identifying and understanding that evidence. So we have nine work packages. I'm not going to talk um, through all of those. This is just to give you a sense um, of the scale of the exercise. Um, I will talk to three of these, though. Um, the first is our mapping of the evidence base. So this involved identifying published systematic reviews in the literature. Um, this turned out to be a much larger task than we'd envisage. Um, as nobody's actually done this task previously. Um, so I'll talk you through a little bit later how we did that uh, and the scale of that exercise. We also developed um, a rating and ranking scale. And the idea of this was to help us assess the quality of published systematic reviews. How well were they conducted? Um, how good was their assessment of the impact on crime of interventions? And what other issues did they speak to that would be of relevance to academics and practitioners um, alike? And then having applied that rating and ranking criteria, the idea was to produce this online toolkit which um, practitioners could access to find out what might work to reduce their crime problems. We additionally conducted 12 new systematic reviews. They haven't yet been completed, um, but all of those 12 should be completed by the end of this year or early next year. And the idea was to focus on topics that we identified as not being covered in the existing um, evidence base or to address nuanced issues that weren't covered in those previous systematic reviews. Okay, so in terms of what works to reduce crime, you'll know that there's an enormous body of, of research on what works. And the, original, the initial information comes from primary evaluation studies where individual researchers or teams of researchers assess the impact on crime or offending of a particular intervention in one situation. Now those evaluations vary um, enormously in terms of their quality. Some will use a kind of before and after design. So we might observe a group of offenders before intervention, apply a treatment, and then observe their behavior um, post-intervention. And the key question there is, does their behavior change after intervention? Now a problem with that kind of design, of course, is that other things can change over time other than the introduction of an intervention. So for that reason, other researchers use quasi-experimental designs where we contrast the change over time in those offenders that receive the treatment with a group of similar offenders who do not. And that helps us to rule out alternative explanations for any changes observed in those offenders. Likewise, we can do this for place-based um, studies where we observe crime rates in an area before and after an intervention. And we contrast conditions for places that do and do not receive that treatment. A problem with the quasi-experimental designs, of course, is that there may be things that we're not aware of that differ between those locations that receive the treatment and those that don't. And for that reason, um, one of the preferred methodologies for assessing impact is the randomized control trial, where offenders are randomly allocated to treatment and control groups, or in the case of place-based interventions, we randomly allocate places to treatment um, and control groups. And the idea is that that rules out all sorts of threats to what we call internal um, validity. So that's primary evaluations. But where there exist a number of primary evaluations, the trick is to combine information across those different evaluations to see what messages uh, they tell us in the aggregate. And it's for that reason that systematic reviews have emerged as a particularly popular way of synthesizing evidence on what works. So the idea with systematic reviews is, first of all, to find all of those studies published on a particular topic or for a particular intervention. Now, because those um, studies can be of variable quality, the trick then is to sort through and sift those studies, to identify those best quality studies to be included in the systematic review, also that we can add appropriate caveats to any conclusions um, that we find. Now, sis, um, primary evaluations can actually be extremely um, hard to locate in the literature. And so with systematic reviews, before you embark on one of these, you write what's called a protocol, which explains exactly how you'll search for those studies and the inclusion criteria that you'll apply to identify studies 
that will be included in that review. And that protocol will be reviewed by experts and comments will be given as to whether or not changes should be made to it. So it's a, it's a large exercise in identi just identifying those studies. Once that process has been completed, the evidence um, is synthesized. And it can be synthesized in a variety of ways. And I'll explain that um, in a moment. But once we have system asset reviews, those too can be really difficult to find. There isn't, there hadn't, previous to what the exercise we've conducted, there wasn't a database of, of existing um, system asset reviews. Systematic reviews can be extremely lengthy. If you've read any of them, some of them are 80 pages, 120 pages long. They can have incredibly technical wording, which makes them difficult to understand. And again, systematic reviews themselves can be of variable quality. So what we wanted to do as part of the What Works Center is to assess the quality of those systematic reviews and put them in a place or a central location where everybody could find them um, and assess them. Okay. Approaches to um, systematic reviewing. So there are at least sort of two ways that you can uh, approach um, a systematic review. There's the Campbell and, and Cochrane approach, which is particularly popular in public health, uh, medicine, and education. And then there's the realist synthesis and, and review approach. And these two different approaches tend to focus on different issues. I'm going to talk through briefly the issues that the two methods um, focus upon. So the Campbell and Cochrane approach has a particular focus on how we estimate effect sizes. So how good is the study in terms of estimating the impact on crime or offending? So for instance, they will focus on issues such as the search criteria used in the study. Um, a particular concern is often that systematic reviews may not include unpublished literature. So a thing that many of you will be aware of is that studies which show a significant impact on crime or significant effects more generally are more likely to be published in journals than are those that show null effects. So it's obviously important when you're doing a systematic review to search for unpublished studies um, because they'll tell a different story potentially than those studies which are published in journals. And I should um, also note that actually this publication bias problem is unfortunately worse in English language speaking journals than in other forms of, of publications. So there's a focus on the search criteria and the eligibility of studies included. There's a focus on the methodological quality of the studies included in the systematic review. So primacy is given to those uh, primary evaluations which use randomized controls or particularly rigorous um, evaluation methodologies. There's also a focus on the statistical methodology used to estimate the impact of a treatment or intervention on levels of crime, and how the study authors actually addressed problems of publication bias and other statistical issues. So in a Campbell or, or Cochrane type review, what the systematic reviewers will often fetch up with is uh, a meta-analysis such as the one um, in front of you. Um, so what this will do typically will list the studies, the primary evaluation studies that were identified through extensive searching, and then provide an estimate of effect size for each and every one of those studies. Now, the example I'm giving you here is for problem-oriented policing. Um, it doesn't really matter um, which study I show you because it's just to illustrate um, how these results are presented. But what you'll get in one of these meta-analyses is an estimate of effect size, which can be presented in numerical form, uh, but is often presented graphically in the form of a forest plot. And in a forest plot like this, we have a reference line of zero, which indicates that there's a no effect of intervention. And then you'll see that there's a point estimate of the effect of intervention for each one of the evaluation studies. So the square dot is the point estimate. If that's on the right-hand side of zero, it indicates that crime went down more quickly in the treatment area than it did in a control area. The horizontal bars are our confidence intervals, so they tell us the range of values within which the true effect of intervention lies. And so if these confidence intervals are to the right of the reference line zero, it indicates a significant effect of intervention. Now a problem with individual um, evaluations is that they typically lack statistical power, so we get pretty wide confidence intervals for most of our estimates. 
So if we were to just look at um, an individual study, we might conclude that in this case, problem-oriented policing had little or no effect. The advantage of meta-analysis is that by pooling these estimates, we increase the statistical power. And we can produce what's called an overall effect size of intervention, which takes account of this additional power. So in this case, um, what we find is there's a significant effect overall of problem-oriented policing on levels of crime. It's a relatively modest effect as estimated in this study, but it is a significant effect in this case. Okay. So, Campbell and Crocken reviews focus on methodological, or tend to focus largely on methodological issues concerning the estimation of effect sizes. The aim is to make sure that we can be confident in the overall impact of an intervention um, on crime or rates of offending. So the focus is on um, high quality designs with high internal validity. That is to say we can be certain that it's the intervention rather than something else which brought about the changes observed. This can be useful in giving objective information as to what sorts of interventions work and what don't work so well. Now a disadvantage with this kind of focus on the estimation of effect size is that it doesn't speak to exactly how an intervention brings about its effects. Nor does it speak necessarily to the conditions under which those effects will be greatest or under which we might observe backfire effects. Lastly, it doesn't really speak to issues such as how do we implement an intervention? What is it that practitioners need to know in order to deliver the same kind of intervention in, under their local conditions? <clears throat> and actually, more than 20 years ago, in their meta-analysis or their review of meta-analyses of psychological, educational and behavioural treatments, Lipsy and Wilson concluded that the proper agenda for the next generation of treatment effectiveness research for both primary and meta-analytic studies is investigation into which treatment variants are most effective, the mediating causal processes through which they work, and so on. So it calls for a different agenda than just estimating the overall effect of intervention. And this is what realist review really speaks to. Um, the focus of a realist review is to try to understand how it is an intervention might bring about its effects. What crimes are affected by that intervention? And under what conditions is it most likely to work? So, for example, does CCTV reduce crime more in car parks than in residential housing estates or in city centres? And it also asks questions about how you actually implement um, an intervention in practice. Now, unlike the approach to estimating the effect size of intervention, Realist reviews are much more of an iterative approach um, to synthesizing evidence. So the idea is to start out with some idea of how an intervention might work. You then seek out evidence to test that theory. And as a consequence of that, we may end up revising our, or refining our theory, then searching out new evidence to test out that theory and so on. So it's an iterative approach um, to analysis. And it might also involve consultation and discussion um, with policymakers or practitioners who have actually implemented these interventions in the real world. I wanted to give you uh, a concrete example of one approach to um, testing out mechanisms. This comes from a, a recent study by David Weisberg um, and colleagues, and it's concerned with um, testing the effects of broken windows policing. Now, this study wasn't focused on what was the impact on crime of broken windows policing, but more on what is the mechanism through which broken windows policing might impact local crime rates. So the first thing they sought to do in this particular study was to articulate the possible mechanisms through which it might work, to make those um, more explicit than previously had been the case. So with broken windows policing, um, we can think of this in a number of ways, but generally the idea is that in an area or, or a neighbourhood, if we see signs of decay in that neighbourhood, the neighbourhood can kind of spiral um, out, of, um, out of control. So offenders will see that there's um, disorder in the neighbourhood and assume that residents are accepting of that sort of behaviour and therefore commit more crimes at that location. As a consequence, residents become fearful and less likely to act collectively um, to reduce crime. So the idea behind the broken windows model, um, or one 
suggestion as to the um, mechanism through which it might work is that it would reduce fear of crime in a neighborhood, which then allows neighbors to act collectively um, to address the problems that they're identifying in the neighborhood, which will ultimately um, reduce crime. So what they did in this um, um, systematic review was not to assess the effects on crime, but to look for evidence of this mechanism um, in action. So they identified those studies which had looked um, at whether broken windows policing impacted upon residents' um, levels or fear of crime. And what you see in front of you is a meta-analysis um, of those studies which did look at um, changes in fear of crime as a consequence of intervention. So where the point estimate is on this side of the reference line of one, in this case the reference line of one uh, is one instead of zero because of the way the point estimate was calculated. If they're on the right hand side this indicates fear of crime decreased um, in the study um, considered. If it's on the left hand side this indicates a kind of backfire effect where fear of crime actually increased as consequence of intervention. And what we see is that overall there was no evidence across these studies of an impact on fear of crime as a consequence of broken windows policing. Therefore, no evidence that the mechanism through which broken windows policing might work is by reducing fear of crime in residents. Um, another point that um, David Weisberg and colleagues make in that study is that not only is there no support for the evidence of, 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 of this mechanism taking place, but there are simply too few studies of the mechanisms and underline the crime control in the broken windows policing model. And we'd sort of say that that actually applies more generally to, to studies um, of policing interventions and other forms of crime reduction. Okay. So I've given you a flavor of different methodological approaches to systematic reviews. What we're advocating is that systematic reviews in the future should incorporate these different styles and answer these different sorts of questions because they're all relevant to both academics. We want to understand whether interventions work, but we also want to understand why they work, how they work, and under what conditions they work best. The same is true of practitioners who need to know whether an intervention will work well in their local context. They'll also want to know exactly what do they need to do in order to implement um, that intervention in their local area. So to give, again, a concrete example of implementation issues, many of you will be aware that the evidence suggests that hotspots policing works to reduce crime. If you read the individual studies and, and the systematic reviews of them, what they're silent on is issues such as exactly what is a hotspot? How do you identify a hotspot? Also, how much police patrol do you need to um, direct to a policing hotspot to reduce crime? How many officer hours or how many officer hours per unit area are necessary to reduce crime to a certain level? And it's those sorts of detailed questions that practitioners are likely to want the answers to if they're implementing an intervention in their area. So as I mentioned before, we came up um, with an acronym and a kind of framework for assessing the methodological quality of systematic reviews, which we've called EMI. Um, this has been published in the Journal of Experimental um, Criminology, and it's been translated uh, by Fernando. So thank you, Fernando, for your excellent translation. And I should have said, actually, throughout, Fernando has translated all of the slides, so I'm incredibly indebted uh, to Fernando. And if there are any jokes embedded in the slides, um, they're not my doing. Uh, so. <laughs> and also, any errors, for that matter, are Fernando's uh, fault. So th thank you. <laughs> so if you are interested in, in, in the ME scale, I, I would direct you um, towards... Uh, this article, but I'll, I'll talk about the scale um, briefly in the next few slides. So it has five dimensions, and the idea is that we would assess systematic reviews along these five dimensions, and also that these dimensions should inform the conduct of future systematic reviews. So the first um, dimension is effect, um, so the impact of an intervention on crime, and that we've discussed um, in, in, in some detail already and is informed by the Campbell and Cochrane approach to systematic reviewing. Second is uh, uh, mechanisms. So this is, is exactly how is it that an intervention brings about its intended effects. And I'll talk in a little while about how we assess that. Thirdly, moderators. 
So what are the contexts necessary for the activation of those mechanisms? And does an intervention work better in some conditions uh, than in others? And just to stress that point, um, the image that I've got in front of you here is, is a slice of pizza. And the point is, hopefully we'd all agree that the pizza looks more appetizing under these conditions or that context than it does um, under this context. Um, if any of you think it looks better under these conditions, uh, I'm not eating lunch with, with, with you guys. Uh, okay. Um, implementation. So the focus here is on what are those conditions which will facilitate the implementation of an intervention, or are there conditions which will actually obstruct the delivery? So what are the things that a practitioner needs to know in order to deliver that intervention in the real world? And finally, something which is really rarely covered um, in primary evaluations of interventions or systematic reviews is surprisingly, how much does it cost? So if an intervention is absolutely effective, it reduces all crime. If it's prohibitively expensive, then it's perhaps of, of little value to practitioners in the real world. And so we feel that assessing the economic costs of an intervention, so how much does it cost per unit of output, or what is the comparison between the monetized benefits of an intervention, so how much crime is reduced, compared to how much it costs to implement it. So that would be the so-called cost-benefit ratio. OK. So I'll talk, in a little while, I'll talk through our review of existing systematic reviews. But before doing that, I just wanted to give you a flavor um, of the WhatWorks toolkit and how this information um, is presented to those who might want to look at it. And again, this is translated by Fernando, so apologies, it's not available in Spanish at this time. But we can talk about whether that might be future endeavor. Um, when you go to the, um, crime, the What Works um, toolkit, you end up on a landing page initially. So this is kind of a dashboard, if you like, which lists all of the interventions for which systematic reviews exist. We then rate and rank each of those interventions on the five dimensions of ME. And in each case, you'll see that there are two lines. So the icons give an indication of what the evidence tells us or whether evidence exists. And at the bottom, we then have indicators which assess the strength of that evidence. So is the evidence weak or non-existent? Um, or if we got stronger or particularly strong evidence on a particular issue? So in the case of effect size, where we have two ticks, that would indicate that statistical meta-analysis suggests that overall an intervention reduces crime um, across those primary evaluations for which evidence exists. A single tick indicates that it doesn't necessarily reduce crime across all primary evaluations, but one or more primary evaluations suggest an impact of that intervention. So one tick might suggest that an intervention works in some conditions, but doesn't work in others, whereas two ticks suggest that it typically works um, across different conditions. In the case of mechanisms, moderators, implementation, and cost, um, the power bars, if you like, at the bottom give us an indication of how thorough that assessment um, is in the systematic review. When the indicators are lit up, this purely indicates that the systematic review spoke to that issue in question. And you can see that in some cases, it's not addressed um, at all. What we then do is, if you're interested in a particular intervention, you, you can click on it, and um, that will take you to a summary page which then provides more detail about that particular intervention. So we have, again, the dashboard at the top. And we have a systematic reporting style um, for what we've called the narrative summary. So first of all, it gives you an idea of what the intervention actually is. We then discuss um, each of the ME dimensions um, in turn. And again, we follow a systematic um, kind of format. Um, and the format for this was discussed in consultation with an expert panel of both uh, police practitioners um, and academics around the world. Um, so we'll address, for instance, what does the study say in terms of um, the intervention's impact on crime? How strong is that evidence? What are the caveats associated with the way in which the studies or the systematic review was conducted? So the idea is to make the findings of the systematic review available in a much more accessible format 
that busy practitioners can use um, um, to inform their decision making. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about how we developed the What Works Toolkit um, and the research exercise that that involved. And I'll talk first of all about how we search for systematic reviews. Um, I didn't know this before we embarked on this research, but it turns out there's an enormous literature in information science on how you do this kind of thing. So this has been documented as part of, of the research, and it's published in the Journal of Experimental uh, Criminology. So I'll talk to that. I'll talk to how we rated the existing evidence, so the systematic reviews that we'd en uncovered. I'll talk about trends in quality. So how good are these systematic reviews and what issues do they speak to? And where do we think we need to go next? So in terms of our inclusion criteria, so before we embarked on this exercise, we again wrote a protocol so which indicated what sorts of studies would we be looking for, what would determine whether a study was included in the What Works Toolkit, and what would determine whether it was not. So we specified it had to focus on crime prevention, had to be a systematic review or a meta-analysis, because we were looking for studies which summarized and synthesized what we know about the impact on crime of a given intervention. And it had to have a measured outcome um, of crime prevention so that we could estimate the effect size um, of intervention. And finally, it had to focus on a single intervention. So what we're looking at here is, does, for instance, CCTV work to reduce crime, rather than um, what interventions work to reduce, let's say, the crime of assault or robbery? So focusing on particular interventions. So the research strategy involved a number of different approaches which mirror pretty much those that are involved in producing um, a systematic review. So it included, for instance, keyword searches of electronic databases. It involved a review of the grey literature. So we would look at uh, government reports and reports produced by the police uh, and research organisations. We also contracted Phyllis Schultz from Rutgers University, who's an, um, an expert on identifying the grey literature. And she conducted searches of her own to complement those that we conducted. We conducted backward searches. So every time we identified a systematic review or an article um, of relevance, we would look through the bibliography to see if we could find other systematic reviews um, in those lists. We hand-searched uh, relevant journals and consulted with experts as to whether they could identify additional studies that might have been overlooked um, in this process. Um, just to give you an idea uh, of what this involves, these are the search terms that we use to identify um, whether a systematic review um, addressed crime. Um, I'm going to go through each and every... No, I'm not going to go through each and every search. We specified um, whether... These are the search terms, rather, we use to specify um, what type of study <coughs> was identified in the database and the kind of outcomes that we were interested in. So this was to ensure that the studies we identified in those databases were appropriate to the, to the issues um, at hand. When we conducted um, this search of the databases, the hand searches and so on, we identified 17,000 studies that needed to be considered. Each dot represents one of those studies. Um, when we did that, the research team who had to look through these looked really pleased and, and delighted uh, that they had to read 17,000 studies. Um, okay, as it happens, the first sift that you do in this process, as with any systematic review, is, is to read through the abstracts um, and the titles to check whether these 17,000 studies really do um, address the issues of which you're interested in. When we did that, it reduced the, the number quite substantially. And I show you this square box just to show you the scale um, of the effort involved in this sort of a process. What we then did was to what we called light code um, the studies based on either the abstract or a complete reading of the article just to ensure in more concrete terms or more precise way whether it really was a systematic review, whether it really did um, estimate the impact on crime of an intervention and so on. And that reduced... Um, our, our, our list still further. And then when we finally applied uh, very detailed um, criteria, 
out of these studies, we ended up with a much smaller corpus of studies, just 82 studies which met um, our criteria. So, for instance, 82 studies focused on the impact on crime of a single intervention. Some of these studies here would have had multiple interventions, um, and so they'd been estimating whether three interventions collectively reduce crime. And since our focus was on single interventions, um, we didn't include them in the toolkit just for now. Okay, just to give you um, a sense um, of how the evidence base has changed over time, this shows you when those systematic uh, reviews were published. The black line is all of the studies. So we can see that actually the, the rate at which systematic reviews are published um, has increased over time, which is, which is good news for those um, who like systematic reviews and use them to inform decision making. You can also see from the graph that the number of reviews varies across different sorts of, of, of interventions. So they, we see that community interventions and correctional interventions have had more uh, reviews than have, for instance, situational uh, crime prevention um, interventions. Okay, so how do these um, reviews that have been published, how do they score um, on our ME scale? And what issues do they speak to um, the most? So first of all, we assessed them in terms of the methodological quality of the systematic reviews in terms of the effect size as estimated. So we came up with a rating scale. I won't talk in detail about this, but it was a, a very detailed rating scale. Um, two, at least two reviewers read each systematic review and scored that systematic review according to the rating scale. I'm summarizing some of the information which was included in that rating scale on the slide um, in front of you, but the reviewers used a very detailed spreadsheet which took their input and then ultimately came up with an automated coding um, as to the adequacy of that study on this dimension. So this included, for instance, um, attention to the search strategy used. So how explicit was the search strategy used um, in the systematic review? The idea is to have a a very explicit search strategy, which is very inclusive, and that if another researcher reran the exercise, they'd identify exactly the same set of studies as were identified in the systematic review. So the focus is on whether it's replicable or not. The second issue is statistical conclusion validity. So how well is the systematic review or the meta-analysis conducted, and does it attend to those issues which are important um, in statistical analysis? Um, risk of bias, so did the studies um, attend to issues such as publication bias and other issues which might affect um, the estimate of effect size? The influence of study design, so if there exist randomized controlled trials and quasi-experimental um, studies, are the systematic reviewers attentive to the differences between the quality of those studies? So does this, would they come to the same conclusion on the basis of the results of the randomized controlled trials as they would for the quasi-experiments. Now, these are issues which have been identified um, by Campbell and, and Cochrane reviewers over the years. To those, we added um, a final um, element, and this concerned the unanticipated effects of interventions. And the, the simplest example I'll give is, in the case of place-based interventions, if an intervention reduces crime at that location, does it simply displace crime to other nearby locations? Or do the positive effects of intervention diffuse to nearby locations so that crime is reduced at those places? Having assessed each of the studies um, along these, um, according to these elements, we came up with a five-point uh, rating scale. I won't go into too much detail. Um, so we, d we divide what we report into two things. The actual evidence itself, so what was the effect size? Was a moderator analysis conducted to see whether or not the effect of intervention varies across certain types of conditions? So, for example, does CCTV work better in car parks than town centres? And then we assessed it according to uh, the quality of that evidence. So this is the five-point rating scale. Zero would indicate a poor study where there's very little consideration of the elements I showed you on this slide. Right through to four, where all of those issues are attended to um, sufficiently in the systematic review. Scores in between indicate that the study uh, lies somewhere between these two extremes in terms of the issues that were, were considered in the review.
Okay. What did we find across um, the systematic reviews? So this just gives you a sense of how across the, the systematic reviews we um, identified, how many of them um, scored zero. So around about six of them were particularly poor reviews that didn't attend to any of those issues I talked to you about before. The majority, or the, the trend really, was for them to attend to many, if not all, of the issues considered. So in terms of estimating effect size, the studies generally were pretty good. We're also interested in whether these patterns have changed over time. So is it the case that more recent studies are better at estimating effects or addressing the other dimensions of ME than, than systematic reviews that have been conducted in the past? So just as a, a crude way of getting to that sort of question, we looked at those studies published before and after 2010 to see whether there were differences in the extent to which they attend to these different issues. And we can see that in terms of estimating effect size, there is some cause for optimism insofar as there are more studies post-2010 addressing all of the issues um, discussed than there were previously. But still more needs to be done, as many of the studies didn't address all of those issues. In terms of mechanisms, again, in this case we indicated on the toolkit whether or not mechanisms were considered at all in the review and then came up with a five-point rating scale which essentially looked at how thorough the systematic re reviewers were in addressing these issues, which ranged from <clears throat> no consideration, so they treat the intervention um, as a black box, right through to four, where they had an a priori specification of how they thought the intervention would bring about its effects, and they collected specific data in order to test whether or not there was evidence of that mechanism. So the study I discussed um, by David Weisberg and colleagues would be an example of a study which would score four on this scale. Again, we had a very detailed code book for assessing studies um, in this way, but I won't provide um, any more detail on that. Um, this is what we found in terms of uh, mechanisms or mechanismos. Um, <coughs> yep. um, what we find in this case is that either the large majority of studies either didn't mention mechanisms at all or included only a very, very broad statement as to how an intervention might work. Some of the studies included a detailed review. So what that means is essentially they read the existing literature and summarized what authors in the literature had suggested might be a mechanism through which an intervention might work. But they didn't provide a test of this in the systematic um, review. Also notable is that in none of the systematic reviews conducted did we find evidence um, of the reviewers actually talking to practitioners or policymakers as to how they felt an intervention might bring about its effects. How have these trends changed over time? Okay. Not that great. And again, one of the reasons for us developing the ME scale was to draw attention to these issues and to highlight the fact that we need to know more about the mechanisms through which interventions work. If we don't know how they work, it's difficult to implement them better in the future or to tune the way an intervention works to maximize its impact on crime. Looking um, at the sorts of um, focus of the intervention, so was it a policing intervention, community, correctional, and so on, one interesting uh, finding which emerges is actually that the systematic reviews of policing interventions seem to be those that are more likely to address issues of the way in which an intervention works than the other types of systematic reviews um, that we looked at. So there is some cause for optimism. Uh, moderators, so again, a five-point rating scale ranging from there's no consideration um, of moderators, so the conditions or contexts in which interventions work best, right through to an a priori um, specification of um, where an intervention or for whom an intervention might work best and data collected to test that. In this case, what we find again, the large majority um, either didn't mention moderators or used ad hoc data. Many used a post hoc um, test, so they used variables of convenience that just happened to be reported in the primary studies, an example of which would be um, that CCTV works best 
better in the UK than it does in the United States, which isn't particularly helpful to uh, a practitioner. Uh, change over time, again, some, a little bit of cause uh, for optimism, but n more um, needs to be done. Um, implementation, again, five-point rating scale from no discussion right through to a very detailed exposition of how an intervention is implemented, what are the potential barriers to implementation, and what is absolutely necessary uh, to, implementation, to implement an intervention successfully. Um, in this case, there was a bit more um, cause for optimism with a number of studies providing more detailed evidence um, on how to implement interventions, and one of the studies providing enough information to replicate um, an intervention um, completely. Again, change over time, a little bit of cause for optimism, but we still need to know um, more. I'm going to hurry now because we're running out of time. Um, economic analysis. So um, economic analysis can be done uh, to varying degrees um, of complexity. We can estimate, for instance, the direct costs of an intervention. So how much is the staff time, the space that's available? We can estimate the intangible costs of an intervention. So what does it impact on the quality of life um, of residents or those affected? We can compute the marginal costs. So we might know how much it costs to implement um, CCTV with 100 cameras, but how much would it cost to add one additional camera if you already have 100? So that would be a much more um, detailed analysis. Again, we go with a five-point rating scale from no mention <coughs> right through to a very detailed um, cost calculation, as discussed. Does anybody want to guess what this next slide looks like? Oh, we know an awful lot about the cost of implementation. So we know the systematic reviews have focused almost, well, not exclusively, but they've focused a lot on effect size, but we really don't know how much these things cost, which is pretty terrifying. Um, for that reason, we've developed um, <laughs> um, one minute, yeah. um, a costing tool. So the idea of this is that systematic reviews don't cover the costs of intervention um, very well, and the reason for that is that the primary evaluations on which they're based don't do so either. So it's necessary to try, well, we think it's necessary to give practitioners tools to actually collect the costs associated with intervention. So I won't talk about this, but we have produced um, a costing tool which allows a practitioner to do all of these sorts of clever things um, in this spreadsheet, which makes collection easy. Okay, conclusions. Um, why do we see these patterns? Why is it that there's more of a focus on effect size um, than some of those other issues? Um, I've listed some of the reasons why I think this is the case, so we can perhaps discuss um, in, in questions. We do need to improve the primary evidence base because systematic reviews draw explicitly upon those. As a possible solution or a way of sort of nudging the evidence base forwards, we've, we've advocated this um, EMI framework in much the same way as a frameworks have been proposed. For instance, um, in medicine, we have the consort guidelines for the conduct of randomized control trials and the AMSTAR guidance uh, for systematic um, reviews of them. If any of what I've said um, has piqued your interest, a number of publications um, to which I'd point to you, and with that, I'll say uh, gracias. for the review of the review of the review. <laughs> um, it was very interesting. Gracias. Uh, really, really interesting. And I think uh, MSKL will, will be um, really useful for, um, for the future of criminology. So thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for the presentation, for the, 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 the time, for everything. Um, uh, I have something to ask you because we talked about it uh, before it's like um, I think we've, we've got some kind of problem of problem of languages uh, because of um, all the systematic reviews are, do are done in, in English so we are here in Spain and we we make our reviews in Spanish and so I think I think we you you can um, you're front of um, 
of uh, a lack of information. Yeah. You know? From Spain, I, I, I can imagine that it's the same of for uh, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and, and, and so I, what can we do? <laughs> <laughs> so there are, yeah, a number of dimensions to that question. Um, one of which is the systematic reviews that we looked at um, in this exercise were those written um, in the English language. Um, the reason for that is that we were constrained by resources. So if I take you back to um, this slide um, with lots of dots on it, um, we had to sift through an awful lot of studies in order to, to complete this exercise. Translating um, an even larger box as it might have been had we been able to identify studies in, in foreign languages um, would have been an, an enormous exercise beyond the scale of which we, we had resources. But we've been mindful throughout the whole process that that's an important task to do and it would be important to do that um, in the future. And that applies to, to the work we've done but it also applies to gen systematic reviews in general where it's not always the case that studies published in other languages other than English are actually included in those reviews. Um, in some cases it is because the abstracts can be published in English which means you can identify which to include on the basis of the, the, the abstract but more needs to be done um, with respect to that. Not least because we've talked about moderators and, and the importance of contact so um, the conditions in, in England or in the United States can be rather different, the policy context than it, than it is for instance in Spain, Italy or other locations and so what works in one location might not work the same in another location simply because the context in which it's implemented is so different um, with respect to laws um, and so on and so forth. So it's a really important thing that, that needs doing and we wish we could have done in this exercise. Thank you. Thank you. Vale, voy a dejar que dejaros la palabra, entonces si alguien tiene una pregunta, uh, un comentario, Juanjo. Okay. Um, Momento. Gracias. Uh, I mean, one of the issues with, with effect, published effect sizes is that they're only a small selection of the possible comparisons that researchers can do. And that also affects the great literature. I mean, that's what uh, Andrew Gelman refers to as the garden of forking pass, or the people talk as the researchers' degrees of freedom. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember when looking at the disagreements about this Pau's abuse replication program that uh, Chris Maxwell and Jeff Fagan talk about how part of the differences in interpretation was the fact that when you actually look at the analysis, you, there were thousands right. of comparisons yeah. Yeah. that could be actually be done just to look yeah. at the impact, the deterrent impact of uh, arrests on crime. Yeah. I mean, some people talk about pre-registration as a possible solution. Say that again, sorry. Pre-registration. -pre of the studies, pre-registration yes, as yeah. a possible solution. Uh, what's your take on this? I mean, and how, how do you think this is an issue in terms of looking at some of these results? So the pre-registration of study yeah, design, yeah yeah. yeah. yeah, and actually in a lot of other fields, it's, it's, it's a requirement that you pre-register uh, a protocol which details exactly how you estimate effects um, of intervention on crime. And I, and I think that's a good thing um, in that it's not possible subsequently to massage your findings to, to, to show those effects that are of most interest to you. Um, one of the, I, I won't go to the slide, but one of the um, points or the issues with respect to the methodological adequacy of estimating effect size concerns this issue of dependency, which is partly what you're talking about here, that you could estimate impact in, in a variety of ways. So we, we did a um, systematic review of the extent to which targeted policing initiatives uh, displace crime or diffuse benefits. Um, and I think ours is the only study in crime to do this, where we, we calculated every single possible permutation. So I think we had 18,000 permutations for the systematic review um, because there are multiple comparison areas, there are multiple time periods, there are multiple crime types, all of which show different effects. Um, so in the review that, that we did, we, we did address that, but I've not seen that done typically. Um, what you see more frequently when, when there are different ways of estimating things, you'll see the best and the worst case scenario contrasted. So they'll redo this, the, the meta-analysis saying this is the worst case scenario, the overall effect size is this, in the best case scenario it, it, it's this one, but it doesn't give you an estimate of the distribution. Um, which 
doing a kind of permutation test would do. So I think we need to do an awful lot more um, with respect to that, both in the statistical methodology, which is really what I'm focusing on here, but also the theoretical um, issues, which I think partly you're getting to in your question, if I understood you right. And again, that then is a focus on mechanisms and moderators is required to trace out exactly why, how an intervention might work, and then collecting that evidence to show that those mechanisms have been triggered or not triggered in, in many cases. And I think that would help to get to some of those issues. Thank you, gracias. Alguien más que se, que se anime a... Ahí veo varias manos. Primero, empezamos ahí. Perdón, ¿eh? luego. <laughs> gracias. Gracias. Uh, hello. Thank you for your wonderful conference. It was a very interesting uh, topic. I was very much interested on the... Um, uh, on the things related, the, 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 let's see, uh, how you wanted to translate this complex analysis into something that practitioners can yep. use uh, easily, can yep. understand, and can uh, use for, uh, for planning new uh, interventions. Yep. Uh, at what point are you on your research on these aspects? Have you, do you know how, how they received these kind of tools? Okay. Okay. Have you developed some of them? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so where did I have this? It's going back. So the toolkit's been live for about a year now, um, and we are adding to this as, as we go along. We, in constructing this, we we did consult with quite a, a large board, uh, sort of uh, group of practitioners. So senior police officers and, uh, what should we say, more more less more junior police officers as well, to ensure that the sorts of detail that we we're including in here were the sorts of questions um, that they required answers to. Um, I think in terms of the extent to which it's being used, I think my answer to that would be uh, mixed. So we're finding that some, so in the UK we have, I'll try to keep track of this, I think there's about 39 police forces now. In the, it used to, be, used to be 43 and then they joined some and you know, Scotland became one and anyway. There's, there's about something like 40. Right? So some of those we know that they're actually using this almost religiously. So they're using this to inform decision making. We know of senior officers who, prior to funding meetings, are consulting with this and then challenging other officers who say, uh, we need to invest in, in this intervention. And they're saying, well, actually, I've looked on, on this toolkit and there's no evidence as to its effectiveness or it doesn't seem to work under these sorts of conditions. So we know it's actually being used um, for those sorts of purposes. Now, Systematically, I, I can't answer that um, for you. There is, I didn't uh, mention this at the beginning, but Work Package 9, I think, um, is being conducted by Mike Huff's team um, in London, and they're doing an independent review um, of the What Works Centre more generally. So the work we're doing is, is one, one component of the What Works Centre. So it, they're not just reviewing what we're doing, but they're reviewing what the College of Policing are doing more generally <coughs> and how practitioners are engaging um, with this kind of um, this kind of approach to, to disseminating the evidence. So, from what I so when I speak to senior police officers, everything the, the feedback I get is great. Um, but those who perhaps don't like it probably don't speak to me. So it's, I, I'm not sure. But it's it's being it is being used. But it could be used more, I think. Yeah. Una última pregunta. Sí, aquí delante. Gracias. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is about your scale, the EMI scale. Yep. You have five items. Yes. The last item is the economic cost of the intervention. Yep. My question would be, what about the so social cost of one intervention? Intervention, because preventing crime is not is not like preventing a disease, okay. a health system. You mentioned intangible yep. costs, yep. but I don't think it's enough talking about uh, yeah. intangible costs, economic costs, I think, uh, for instance, imprisonment could be work re reducing crime, but the social cost of yeah. imprisonment or CCTV have also social costs. Yeah. How do you think about mm, introducing in your scale something to take into to account the social cost? We haven't, so first of all, it's, it's got five letters at the moment. Um, and they were memorable because we quite like the idea that you get an Emmy for, you know, uh, an intervention. 
it, it's uh, parallel with an award. Um, so we could add another letter. Uh, we could add many other letters, but we would, we would hope you could come up with a suitable... Uh, so S would probably work well at the end of it. Um, Emmys. Um, one thing I... And we would like to do that because we would see this as an organic thing, that we've identified five things that we and practitioners think are important, but there will be other, other issues. Um, the intangible costs, um, as, we, as we perceive them, um, there's, if you read um, this excellent book, um, you will see in there, uh, if you can see what it says on that excellent book, um, the way that we talk about intangibles and opportunity costs would incorporate um, some of the issues that you've talked about here. So there are, for instance, opportunity costs of an intervention, which it's not quite the point you were making, but it might affect local businesses, for instance, which often isn't included in these studies. It might have an effect on people's fear of crime um, or the way they feel about um, their environment. So there was, we, we've recently conducted a national evaluation of the impact of street lighting on crime and road traffic accidents. And one of the elements of that was do changes to lighting affect things other than those two dependent variables? So people's um, sleep patterns, um, how they feel about the area, because changes in lighting make an area look rather different. And so the idea was to try and capture those issues. Now, measuring them is extremely difficult because not, there isn't an obvious scale for capturing those. So two things. A, we have tried to discuss it a little bit in, the, in, the, in these sorts of estimates and that there are broader issues that one needs to consider. But let me think about whether we can add another letter to that scale. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Um, thank you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the presentation, for the, the, the response. And uh, we have to close. To yep, sure. sure. See. But um, I, I'm sure that today you've got uh, the, the, the occasion of to, to talk with sure. not everyone, but a lot, a lot no, of No, no, I want to talk to every <laughs> one of you. <laughs> Una última cosa. Pepe Cid quiere comentaros algo, así que... ¿Cómo? Por supuesto. Por supuesto.